Well, we have been in this series called Think Again. Everybody say, Think Again. Think again. This series is preparing you to build your emotional strength so that you can overcome those negative feelings and thoughts that tend to deplete your energy and minimize your joy. In week one, Pastor taught us how to increase our joy capacity by examining how we see ourselves. Self-deprecation is not a spiritual gift. Actually, it's a spiritual insult. Look at the person next to you and say, I'm figgy and I'm fine. And if you're like, what on earth is this woman talking about? You got to go back on YouTube and watch the very beginning of this series two weeks ago. It'll change your life. Last week, we learned how to recognize destructive thoughts early on and what to do about them. Look at the neighbor you ignored the first time and say, Dagon must fall. Today, we are going to increase our joy quotient by increasing our emotional strength. Let's say this tennis ball represents an event in life that just dropped on you. The car died, furnace went out, sound familiar? Relationships begin to unravel rapidly. The layoff came quickly. The kids got wacky. Life just dropped. You see, this is what happened to the Apostle Paul, the author of the book of Philippians, who we just read from in chapter 3. People who hated his message that Jesus was risen from the dead and that he was, in fact, the unique son of God who came to save them. It was a message of hope. These people hated that message so much that they attacked him physically. They assaulted him verbally. They tried to stronghold him emotionally. And yet he found himself in a Roman prison cell writing the Bible's greatest thesis on the subject of joy. Paul has what we might call emotional resilience or a bounce back mentality. Paul said, we're going to bounce back. Have you ever found yourself, have you ever found yourself wanting to bounce back from a setback? Paul can relate. He's like, I get it. He said, I didn't ask for this. I didn't want this. I didn't plan this. I wish I could change this. But because Christ is my foundation, I can bounce back from this. However, have you ever found yourself in an event where something happened and you thought you would have been able to bounce back a lot quicker than what you actually did. And instead of bouncing back, you dribbled into a prolonged season of despair and sadness and worry and depression and isolation. You removed yourself from friends and church community, the very entity that Jesus designed to build your faith. And you found yourself just stuck and sunk. Paul wants to say to you this morning, church, nah, let's develop an emotional resilience and a soul strength. Come on, tell the person next to you, bounce back from a setback. You don't have to stay there. Emotional strength refers to three things. Emotional resilience that says I won't break. Emotional control that says I won't lose it. And then emotional toughness that says I can handle it. Emotional strength is what fuels our capacity to experience joy without the disruption of prolonged sunk negativity. Now, here's what this doesn't mean. And I know you're already thinking it. Does this mean we deny our feelings and we just act like everything's good all the time? No, it does not mean you deny or ignore the real problems of life. It's about staying in control and handling the problem so that the problems of life don't mishandle you. One psychologist said, emotions are subjective indicators of objective experiences, which is just a fancy way to say our perspective determines our belief. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Let's say that you are hiking in the woods and you come across, out of nowhere, unexpectedly, a long, curvy, slimy-looking object. And you see it, and you yell, snake! And you jump back, you may experience fear. You may stop in your tracks. You may retreat. You may speak in a tongue that needs no interpretation. 
maybe a little freaked out. That's because your response was rooted in what you thought you saw. But now let's imagine for a moment that you do step back and you look a little more closely and you realize, oh, wait a minute, that's not a snake. That's just a rope in the path. Well, what happened the first time? What you perceived created a belief. The belief created emotions. The emotions created a physical response. It didn't matter that the rope was not a threat. Your belief created an emotional and physical response that, oh yeah, it was. And what's true of the rope is true of our emotions. When we think things like, oh, I thought they were being rude on purpose, so I responded accordingly. Turns out they were just having a bad day. Or I thought that they thought they were better than me, so I responded accordingly. Turns out I was just being insecure. Or I thought they were trying to insult me, so I responded accordingly. Turns out it's just their personality. Perception determined belief, and then what happens is belief elicits a response. But let's also say that we are walking down that same path, and there really is a snake, and there really is a threat. You see, in Paul's case, there really were real threats. People really were out to get Paul. He really was in prison. He really was shipwrecked. He really was beaten and flogged and searched after and left for dead. He read the situation right. He wasn't misinterpreting anything. And yet, Paul is teaching us that our job is to become proficient at interpreting the events of life in such a way that we remain empowered to improve them and not become a victim of them. How many of you know that one of the scariest places in the world is being at church alone at night, all by yourself? Come on, any 80s kids whose parents left you sleeping in the pew late at night at church and the only reason they knew that they left just because 911 called them and said, hey, is this your kid? Oh, whoops, yeah, just me? Anybody else? Okay, I might be a little scarred from that. But man, when I was a kid, being at a church by yourself at night, especially when the churches had a basement, look out. A couple years ago, my husband and I, we were, we had to come by the church late one evening and we were by ourselves. nobody else was there. So we came in, we turned off the alarm. We began to walk around and do what we need to do. We were there alone. It was dark. And then the alarm starts going off. We were freaking out. Derek looks at me and says, this is how we die. (laughs) So of course I'm trying to encourage him and live. And then it dawns on him that, oh, I thought I turned off door activation. I turned on motion activation. We were our own intruders. Paul is telling us this morning in Philippians chapter 3, he says, be careful how you manage your mind. So how do we do that? Let's look at it practically. I'm sure throughout your life you have been asked about your goals many a times. What are your life goals? Your career goals, your spiritual goals, fitness goals, financial goals. But have you ever been asked about your emotional goals? Now think about that. Our emotions make up a large part of who we are. The quality of our relationships, our success at work, our confidence in life. But we tend to think about our emotions the least. Well, today we are. Did you know that as a believer in Jesus, you can be full of emotion and be fully in control. We just read it earlier in verse 14, Philippians chapter three, Paul said, I have a made up mind. That means it doesn't matter what comes at me, what emotions try to come my way. I have decided how I'm going to respond. In verse 15, he said, I have a maturing mind. That means it's daily being transformed. And in verse 16, he said, Hey, let's be of the same mind. And so in order to master our emotional life, we have got to understand three simple laws of the mind. And when you operate in harmony with these laws, they will increase your level of joy. Could anybody use a little joy increase this morning? Come on, the Bible is going to show us how the first law we want to look at is the law of attention. 
Where your attention goes, your thoughts grow. Philippians chapter 3, verse 1, Paul says, Rejoice in the Lord. He's telling us that the placement of our attention defines our joy. If you're looking for something to rejoice in and you're like, hey, my life's going pretty lousy today. It's not so great. I don't really have a reason to smile. Paul says, oh, yeah, you do. Rejoice in the Lord. The placement of our attention defines our enjoyment. The average person thinks 50,000 thoughts a day. And each thought moves us either toward our God-given potential or away from it. Whatever you choose to dwell upon becomes increasingly potent in your mind. Let me show you what I'm talking about. My son, Cade, he's six right now, but a few years ago when he was really little and just kind of like barely walking and wobbling along, we had a dog. And so we took the dog outside. He was still kind of trying to figure this dog out. And um, we're outside, and the dog did what dogs do, and Cade's really interested um, in in him going to the restroom, and he wants to waddle over and try to pick up, you know, this thing on the ground, and as I'm trying to stop him, he goes over there, and he bends down, squats real close, and the closer he gets, his face starts to turn, and he's like, ew, yuck, stink, move, and I'm like, get away from it, don't hover over it, you don't have to stay there, don't we do that in relationships? We stay mindful of the, meg- the negative qualities in our spouse. The longer we do that, the stronger the smell becomes. The more we complain about the kids, the quicker and stronger that irritation becomes. But here's the beautiful part. It works both ways. The more attention we give to gratitude, the stronger that fragrance becomes. The more life-giving attention we give to our kids, the more influence we will have over their lives. The more we think about the promises of God, the greater our spiritual convictions become. It's the law of attention. You move in the direction you're looking. Where your attention goes, your thoughts grow. You will always feel what you dwell on the most. Romans 12, 2 says, don't conform to the pattern of this world. Don't fit in so easy without even thinking about it. But he says, instead, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, by the renewing of your thoughts. He says, then you'll be able to attest and approve what God's will is. How many times do you pray, God, show me your will? What am I supposed to do next? Lord, is this from you? Is this a door I'm supposed to walk through? Should I kick down this door? God, what would you have for my family? Should we say yes to this? Should we say no to this? Romans is telling us, if you want to know the answer to that, renew your mind. Transform your thoughts. Then you'll be able to approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, perfect will for your life. Paul's saying God's revelation comes from a renewed mindset. Now, let me be clear about something this morning. Right thinking has nothing to do with salvation, okay? Salvation is based solely on the blood of Jesus, his death on the cross, and his resurrection. But what I am saying is that some people will be in heaven because they did accept Jesus as their Savior, but... They never walked in victory or fully enjoyed God's plan for them on earth because they never had their mind renewed. You don't have to live like that. God wants you to have both salvation and mind renewal. The second law that Philippians chapter 3 teaches us this morning is the law of exchange. Now, I love this because... Paul's not in denial. He's not like, no, guys, the answer is not to brush your feelings under a rug and to walk around, bless the Lord while you're bleeding out. No, 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 no. He said, we're not going to be in denial. He's not ignoring the trouble. Remember, we read about it in verse 2. He brought up things that could possibly hinder his joy, like those dogs. Paul's like, who let the dogs out? Those were evil workers those manipulators, those mutilators, those competitors. I mean, he is listing out the people and the things that are causing him trouble. He is not ignoring it or looking over it. But he says, you know what? 
I refuse to allow them to become a distraction from the grace of God on my life. It doesn't matter what they do. I've got my eyes focused on Jesus. That's why he says in verse 8, you know what? I count all things lost compared to knowing God. The bad things, the good things, all things. The people that celebrate you, the people that are out to get you, I count them all as lost compared to knowing God. The law of exchange teaches us that negative thoughts must be replaced with positive thoughts. He's not just like, y'all need to be thinking about something else, y'all. Like when your kids come to you, you're like, mommy, I'm scared, what do I do? You don't just say, go back to bed, honey, you'll be fine. You'll say, let me give you some other things to think about. Paul gives us some other things to think about. He said, hey, exchange those negative thoughts for whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is excellent and praiseworthy. Think about those things. That's because our conscious mind can hold only one thought at a time. So let's look at it this morning. I'm going to show you two menus of emotions. And maybe you're going to want to take your phone out in just a minute and take a picture so you can take this with you this week. One's going to be negative. One's going to be positive. Let's look at the negative one first. Oh, okay, here we go. We got a negative menu of emotions of fear, resentment, boredom, loneliness. Oh, sound familiar? Fatigue, insecurity, guilt. How many times we have to deal with that one? Depression or rage or overload, confusion, exhaustion. Nobody wants that menu. That's like going to McDonald's for your anniversary and saying, no, I said ribs, not McRibs. <laughs> no, we don't want that. But the opposite is a positive menu. Things like joy, excitement, contentment, confidence, peace, passion, drive, satisfaction, enthusiasm, all energy, gratitude. Now that sounds like a Ruth Chris kind of menu to me. Philippians 4, 8 says, you don't have to keep every negative thought that comes to your mind. If you're having a hard time replacing it, think about whatever's true. Think about whatever's noble. Think about whatever's right, pure, lovely, praiseworthy. Well, where do we find those things? In the word of God. Think on these things. You overcome negative thoughts and evil with good. It's the idea of giving thought to your thoughts. Think about what you're thinking about. I love Psalms 48, verse 9. David says, oh God, we meditate on your unfailing love. We think on it, and we think on it, and we think about your love. Psalms 143, David says, my spirit grows faint within me. That sounds like honesty. He says, my heart is dismayed. He's not brushing anything under the rug. He's being real. But I meditate on your works and consider all that your hands have done. David said, I pulled up to the, the table of today and I received two menus. What does my soul want to feast from today? Do I want McRibs or a filet mignon? We have the choice. And it is not dependent on what is happening around us or to us. Listen, we could raid around all day for our spouse to get it together, to start helping around the house, to finally listen for your kids to wake up and call you blessed like the Proverbs 31 woman we are. Or you can take up the options available to you and not allow those negative thoughts to make residence in your mind. Don't allow a temporary thought of negativity to build a gated community in your mind. You don't have to do it. Take it apart brick by brick and exchange it for whatever's true. Productive thinking always disrupts unproductive thoughts. Parents, we know this. Like any time we, our kids begin to interrupt, we're like, oh, no, 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 we don't interrupt. That's rude. We don't do that when someone else is talking. But... If they're being little sassy pants or sarcastic or rude, we will absolutely interrupt them. And that's because disruptors of peace should be interrupted. When you catch your soul reading from that negative menu, you got to interrupt that thought. You got to be like, oh, no, 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 no. Wait a second. Nope. I think instead I'll meditate on your works and consider all that your hands have done. It's the law of exchange. You have a choice in the matter. 
You don't have to wait around and wait for happiness and joy to fall in your laugh lap. You have soul and emotional strength and fortitude this morning, and it's found in Jesus. Lastly, the last law that Philippians 3 is teaching us is the law of alignment. The law of alignment. Now, this is one of the most effective but least utilized methods for developing emotional strength. And that is acting your way into the feelings you desire most. If you are not experiencing as much joy as you would like, you can over time behave your way into emotional strength. You can. Paul said in verse 14, he said, I press on toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. The word press implies discipline. He's saying, I don't feel like doing this, but he's making himself do it. A while back, I was out with my kids. We had had a big day, had lots of fun, and it was time to come home. We were driving in the car, and I was like, okay, kids, we had a great day today. We're going home, and when we get home, we're going to take a little bit of time. We're going to clean up our rooms. We're going to clean up the kitchen, do a little dishes, and um, immediately, oh, no, Mom, I'm exhausted. I'm so tired. I can't. They're both winning Oscars in the back seat for fake sleeping. And so I responded. I was like, oh, that's a bummer. I was first going to stop by Sweet Frog. Instantly, Kate is resurrected back to life. Let's go. I was like, I thought you were tired. Not anymore. At first, they reinforced the feeling of fatigue by focusing on the hassle of their frustration. Seconds later, they zapped out of that feeling with a vision of a preferred future. When you have a compelling reason to get back up, to stand up, to march on, you will discover that you can do what you didn't feel like doing in the beginning. You can sit around and wait for those feelings to be triggered from the outside, or you can behave your way into them now by faith. By faith. Think about this. The word emotion is 86% motion. There's movement to it. I hear this all the time. That just sounds fake to me. Like, I don't want to be fake. I'm real. I can't help how I feel, and I don't feel like I should squelch my feelings and not let people know how I'm really feeling. Okay. But to me, that sounds as ludicrous as telling a person who is at the gym, working out, trying to lose weight and get in shape. Y'all stop being fake healthy. That's ridiculous. They're not being fake healthy. They are working on their health. Moving your way into better feelings is not phony. It's a discipline of faith that aligns your behavior with your values. Paul said, I take captive every thought. That's a verb. Sometimes you have to verb your way into emotional strength. Now it may feel a little weird at first, but even a new pair of shoes requires a break-in period before they feel natural. If you're like, yeah, I just, I don't want to be fake. I don't want to be a phony person. But do you want to be a person of faith? And has God been good or not? Is he good or not? Do you believe that he's in control or not? Do you believe that he is your healer or not? Is God your provider or not? Is God your ever-present help in time of trouble or not? Is God the rock that is higher than you or not? Is he your help? Is he your deliverer? You have to take captive every negative thought, exchange it, replace it, align it with the truth that you profess. It's a choice. This is the law of alignment. You act up to your values, not down to your feelings. You see, Paul, he was in prison, like actually in prison, not metaphorically. He was literally in prison. He was physically unable to do what God had called him to do. He had had a divine, miraculous experience with God on the road to Damascus. God met with him. He saw Jesus, gave him a call on his life, changed his name. You would think if you have that kind of experience that the heavens are going to part and people are going to get out of your way and you will experience no persecution, nothing, no trials. You're going to be well on your way. No, Paul, he's in prison. So he's like, God, you called me to this. Now I literally can't do this. 
But what did Paul do? He didn't sit and sunk in the mud. No. He said, what can I do? He said, I can write. I can pray. I can encourage. I can worry. I can worship. He said he had a bounce back mentality. He didn't stay down. You got to love Paul's defiance against what was trying to come against him. He's like, lock me up, I'll sing in prison. I'll praise in chains. Bit by a snake, I'll shake it off. Shipwreck me, I'll start a church. Chain me to a guard, I'll give him Jesus. I'll reverse it, I'll exchange it, I'll attend to it. He said, but what I won't be is controlled by it. Come what may, I've got a joy unspeakable that can't be taken from me. The world didn't give it, the world can't take it away. My joy, my hope, my faith is in Jesus. Come on, that's the kind of joy that is available to you this morning, church. As believers, this is what makes you invincible. What can man do to you? What can sickness do to you? You have an eternal home in Jesus. Would you stand with me all over this place? We don't have to just make it through life until we finally get on the other side and, and Jesus is waiting for us. No, Jesus said that I come, that you would have life and have life to the full. There's a full life available for you this morning. And so I wanna pray some powerful scriptures over you. If you would just close your eyes, if you feel comfortable, raise your hands to receive it. If this is for you and you wanna receive all God has for you, would you raise your hands with me in this place? God is your refuge and your strength. He is your ever-present help in time of trouble, Psalms 46.1. God guides you with counsel. He leads you to a glorious destiny, Psalms 73.24. God will keep you in perfect peace as you trust in him, as you keep all your thoughts fixed on him. Jesus said, come to me, all who are weary and heavy burden, and I will give you rest in Matthew 11. Jesus said, you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free, church, in John 18. As Paul said in 2 Timothy, God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and self-control to build your emotional strength the Christian life is one of joy, rejoicing, which is independent of all circumstances and suffering. It is founded in the peace of God. So Lord, let your peace reign in our hearts. Lord, help us to remember that nothing can get in the way. Lord, help us to leave with a tenacity like Paul to bounce back that says no suffering can take the joy of your salvation away from me. Lord, we know that in you, all things are possible, that I can stand with joy, two feet on the ground, ready to bounce back no matter what life throws at me. God, we thank you that you love us that much to give us these tools. God, that joy, joy, unspeakable joy is ours for the taking. While your heads are still bowed and your eyes are closed, it's more than just right thinking. It's a right decision. If you're here this morning and you would say, you know what? I've been coming for a little bit. I've been listening, but I have never really truly made the decision that I wanna follow Jesus and I wanna allow him to be Lord of my life. He wants to fill you with joy this morning. It's something that no one can take from you. And all it is is, is it's a decision away because it's a free, gift of salvation. The word of God says, whoever, that means anybody who calls in the name of the Lord, they will be saved. So if you would say that's you in this room, would you raise your hand online? Can you let us know? Come on, if you want to make a decision, I see the hands. Anybody else to give your life fully to Jesus? Yep. Yep. And accept his joy. Yep. It's as simple as just saying, God, I invite you in. I recognize that you are the son of God, that you came to set me free because you love me. And so God, would you forgive me of all the times I pushed you away and I've sinned against you. God, I accept your salvation and I wanna walk in that freedom. 
If you meant that in your heart, you are saved. Come on, church. Can we, can we celebrate with our friends? Come on. We're in this together, baby. If that was you, we want to celebrate with you and resource you. You can text FAITH to 797979. You can stop by the Connect Center. We have a free gift for you, a Bible. You should come to Growth Track next week. Listen, God is for you. Who or what can be against you? Not life, not death, not present, not future, not things from the past or things to come can separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We love you, church. We will see you next week for Baptism Weekend. Go enjoy! joy.